Coming up on Techzilla, Lightroom 3, we got the review from Lloyd Case, Home Theater, PC, Plus Gaming. We got a build for you. Veronica's on vacation, so we got Robert Herod in helping us answer your viewer questions. So heat up the wok, pour in some oil, and stir fry some rice. Ew, because Techzilla <laughs> starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by the new Ford Fiesta, it's a pretty big deal. Squarespace and Gamefly.com. Go to www.gamefly.com slash Techzilla for your free trial membership. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands-on reviews the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or the cheapest organic nuts at Trader Joe's, We've got an answer. And if we don't, we'll track down someone who does. <laughs> Hulu, people. Hulu Plus. Did you hear about Hulu Plus? Yeah, I heard it's finally yeah. going to go HD. Yeah, 720p. Nice. If your system will kind of handle the streaming on that. Um, so what's really fascinating about this is not just the $10 a month for Hulu Plus, but it's, Hulu's actually giving a tepid hug to the living room. PS3, Xbox 360, Samsung Blu-ray players, various internet-enabled TVs, all ACTVs, all coming under the Hulu Plus banner. Actually, dedicated applications for the iOS on the iPad and the iPhone. Nice. I signed up. I got, I got, a, I got an invite. It's kind of in a, a, a rolling beta, right? Because they're inviting people. You sign up. You agree to pay 10 bucks a month. And they still have pre-rolls on movies and commercials. True, true. But they also had a pretty good list of shows that are currently out there, fairly new shows that are out there. If you want to see like every episode of a particular show and right. you haven't gotten into it, I think you're going to be able to get that content through Hulu. I in, basically in HD sat quality, down. whatever that will be, I, it, 720p ish. Well, I was funny because I had my iPad out. It was 480p on the iPad. It was kind of bummed me out. I'm still okay. trying to find something that'll play the 720p video. I haven't found it yet. I know it's out there. I'll find it. <laughs> I found the switch inside of Hulu that turns on 720p. Um, normally, it basically scales down from whatever your bandwidth will handle. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe when I restart my system or, or go to my big giant Core i7 system in the basement, I'll get 720p. So you're in on the beta? I'm in on the beta. Because it's not available to everyone yet. I, I, I signed I, up. I'm begging. I continue to beg. I will. I am. <laughs> I don't ask me how I got it because I, I, I got it. I, I, I stole it from one of our marketing guys. Nice. In any case, Finland. Hey. This, <laughs> I couldn't resist this story. No? You should do this one. Hey. Fin Finland has made broadband a legal right. Now, mm -hmm. according to the BBC, they say that on July 1st, every Finn will have the right to access a 1 megabit per second broadband connection and is vowed to deliver 100 megabit per second lines to every Finn by 2015. Nice. Communications Minister Suvi Linden told the BBC, we considered the role that the internet, uh, of the internet in Finn's everyday life. Internet services are no longer just for entertainment, unquote. Now, according to the article, around 4,000 homes remain unconnected in the country. I wish we could say that about the United States, but uh, you know what? That's still, that's good penetration. Yeah, it's, it's like there's literally yeah, only 4,000 houses left in Finland, apparently, that don't have to deal have with the Rockies in the Midwest. You yeah, have the big open spaces <sighs> in Nevada and South Dakota. The signals. We've been actually talking a lot about population density on the show go. lately. Some interesting tidbits. Google bought ITA. Why do you care? It's a Boston-based developer of flight information software. Again, why do you care? Because finding cheap tickets and the best route for that next business flight could change dramatically in the near future. Imagine yes. Google taking on like Expedia and Kayak and everything else out there. I um, like competition. Yeah, or monopolies as the case may be. And the first class action lawsuits over the iPhone 4, or more accurately, the antenna design that many folks are having trouble with, has been filed. Gizmodo and pretty much every other website we're talking about this online. There's like like there's a, a slew of iPhone 4 lawsuits coming out. Yes, the, the grip. It's all in the grip, people. It's all in the grip. And if you want to actually see the numbers behind the whole grip, check out Anantech.com. He did a great article. Talk. Basically, he analyzed like the signal strength, actual signal strength, rather than looking at the stupid bars on the phone. So I heard some report that Apple had put uh, job listings out for eight antenna engineers <laughs> prior to the launch of the iPhone. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I should do a little research, but that was out there. The, the funny thing is, though, it actually is a better antenna than the 3G. It's just that whole, you know, touching it with your hand thing. People apparently are using Livestrong bracelets and rubber bands to <laughs> as, cover the outside edges instead of buying the little $30 band if you can find I like one. how Verizon and Nokia and other companies are all just on, they're making fun openly about this whole situation right now. <laughs> it, it, it is, it, it feels good. 
<laughs> Tape fixes it. Brian needs a little help dumping his cable box. He writes in, I pay 15 bucks a month to rent a digital HDR DVR box from Comcast. If I could buy my own AC DVR cable box, could I hack the box to also access a NAS and or an external hard drive for viewing my own legal digital movie collection? Best regards, Brian in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Hmm. Can, it, can your TiVo access stuff off of a NAS or a server? Yes. Or your network? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's no problem. Uh, but I would say just build your own when it becomes feasible. Get your home theater PC on. That's what I'm thinking. Like the Seton uh, Infina 4 tuner, quad tuner cable card product, if it ever ships, they're claiming it's mid... Uh, mid-2010, which it is right now. I I'm should waiting on that. Let but. me translate. The Seton board that Mr. Heron is so excited about will basically accept four cable card tuners. Because Comcast, basically, oh. if you ask Comcast, one multi-stream card. Cable card. One multi-stream card. Will give me quad tuning capability. Really? Yeah. It's, but there are, if you want to have like a single or two channels, there are cable card boards you drop into a PC now, right? Totally. Okay. But, uh, but you only need one multi-stream card. It can okay. support up to, it really depends on the capabilities of the hardware and the recording, but that one card will be able to deliver four simultaneous streams mm -hmm. if you have the capability of actually recording that or, you know, manipulating that data, it's that flow of data. I can't remember, is it Home Run is the other, they're actually out there and you can actually buy them on like the Seton, they work over, they capture video streams and move them over your network. But I think we're both saying buy a home theater PC, put a cable card in it, use Windows Media. You will have a greater selection of file types to be able to access off your network. Uh, you will be able to access pretty much any network device on your network, obviously. My only concern with going with TiVo is that you're going to be pretty much locked into whatever they support and whatever the TiVo is capable of decoding. So you might have to, maybe if you're dealing with multiple formats like Matroska and AVIs and H.264 files, you might have to do some transcoding either on the back end on another computer or uh, just have that stuff only download certain types of content that are compatible with your TiVo. So just for the flexibility, and you're going to have to pay a monthly service fee with TiVo anyway unless you can get the unlimited plan. If you've owned one before, you're usually able to get one of those. Uh, can I would you just transfer your unlimited plan from an older TiVo to a new TiVo? No, it's lifetime for the device. That so you, you can sell that device and so forth and so on, but uh, once, once you're locked in, it's locked into the, the unit itself. TiVo or build yourself a home theater I'm PC. more in line. I have not, I would not buy a cable. If I could buy a cable box from a cable provider, heck no, man. Those are some of the worst pieces of garbage hardware I've ever had to deal with. Somebody <laughs> else has it. Half of them don't work right. Right. And then the other half they do, it's like, what do you want? You really want to dig into somebody else? And the hard drives are too small. It's just a nightmare. Build your own. Especially when this darn card I keep talking about, that Seton card, ships. Still to come, people, Lightroom 3 reviewed our specs for a solid all-around home and home theater PC and a little help dealing with ye old cable modem and router. While we got your attention, though, we want to thank one of our sponsors, the new Ford Fiesta. We've had the opportunity to drive this car around the area. I believe we have some video of the in and out run we did earlier. And I gotta say, mm, I like it, people. Serious mileage, but you know what? The Fiesta also comes loaded with tech. As much as many premium cars, it costs quite a bit more, like three or four times as much. A four-inch multifunction LCD display, push-button starts, keyless entry, great for avoiding zombies, and Sync. If you haven't seen it, and I'm pretty sure you have if you're a longtime Texilla viewer, Sync technology steps it up a notch. We used it when driving this bad boy all over the Bay Area. With Sync, you can control your music, your directions, and much more with your voice. Okay, I have a little issue with the auto dialing, but you know what? My mother can barely understand what I'm saying most days. It is one of the most sophisticated comm system ever built into a vehicle. Aside from all the cool technology, the 2011 Ford Fiesta can save you some coin. We're talking 40 miles to the gallon highway. That beats over 20 hybrids on the market. Matter of fact, with a Fiesta, you can drive all the way from San Francisco to LA on less than one tank of gas. They make the Ford Fiesta for city lovers. It's great for getting around in urban clutter. It's easy to park, but I gotta say, the thing is fun to drive. Stand on it, it goes, ooh, and you know what? It's a lot more maneuverable than anything I've owned in a while. Get yourself out to a Ford dealer, check one out today, the 2011 Ford Fiesta. It's sweet, I like to drive it. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, the Video LAN Client. A Texilla favorite, VLC, AKA the Video LAN Client, is a powerful and free media player. It supports a variety of different video and audio formats like AUG, WMA, AVI, H.264, Matroska, MPEG, FLV, DVD video, just to name a few. You also get multi-channel audio decoding and video processing like deinterlacing, making VLC the perfect complement to any home theater PC. With the latest release of VLC, you can now take advantage of GPU hardware acceleration for smoother, less CPU intensive playback 
and you can embed your video into your desktop background, wallpaper style, so you can work and watch your favorite videos at the same time. So if you haven't downloaded and installed VLC on your PC, Mac, or Linux machine, what are you waiting for? Download VLC today. We know there are a lot of photography buffs out there watching, so when Lloyd told us he'd be getting hands-on with Lightroom 3 for a review, we asked him to come on and talk about the difference between photo management software and photo editors and why you might want to be running something like Lightroom or Aperture if you manage a big old photo collection. Lloyd, welcome back to the show, man. Hey, good to see you. You, uh, is your, your kit's missing. Hopefully it wasn't stolen. Nope, you, it's right behind you. You are, are a completely... And since it seems to be the word of the month for me, I'm going to say an unhinged photography enthusiast. Two kids. I, is it safe for me to unzip this? You can unzip it if you don't tip it over. <laughs> if I don't throw it over the side of this. Otherwise, but, you owe me a lot of money. Yeah, we're going to be really gentle with this because your camera setup is worth a lot more than my truck. How many, how many photos do you think you have stashed around in various drives at home? I have several hundred gigabytes worth of raw photos. Several hundred gigabytes. Right. So not, well. I have a two terabyte drive that's about one third full with just photographs. That's a lot of photographs. And that's assuming, uh, do you keep all of your photographs or do you throw any away? I tend to keep them, yeah. Partly because it's just too much work to filter through them. <laughs> so I just get bigger drives every time they come out. So Lightroom isn't Photoshop. It's like a compliment to Photoshop. Yeah, it's, it is, what Lightroom is, is it's, think of it as a photo editor just for photography. Mm -hmm. It doesn't do text. You can't, you know, do all the stuff you would do with Photoshop, the standard image, and you can't draw lines on it. All it's just for developing and printing photographs. Think of it as a photo studio for your, your PC, is essentially what it is. And Aperture is the same way. It's just a photo management and photo uh, specifically, specifically for photographers. Mm -hmm. and photographers. So when you look at Lightroom, do you think of it as like something that makes it easier to sort of delve through your photo collection, or is it primarily just doing the best job possible at, at, at getting your photos off the hard drive and into the physical world? It's a little of both. It's a, it, it's a what's called a workflow application as well as an editor. So it manages your workflow. Uh, it goes through the steps of the library steps, you know, where you bring in your stuff from your camera, uh, sort it, manage it put it into the folders you want to put it into, that kind of stuff. Then it's got the develop part, which is just what it sounds like, where you make the changes and tweaks to your pictures. Uh, you can do slideshows. You can output to printers. It has a really robust printing part, too. It's made to print on those big format printers and stuff. I like that thought. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the develop panel. What's going on there? Well, the develop panel is pretty cool. It's where you do a lot of your main work. And you can do the basic stuff, like remove red eye correction, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you can do things like adjust white balance and all that stuff. The coolest part of it, in terms of Lightroom 3, what they added, two things. Noise reduction. Ooh. Noise reduction. It had in, in earlier versions of Lightroom, but it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Turn your fat. Right. I mean, basically, it, was, it wasn't noise reduction so much as it was sort of posterization. Right. Like, for example, <laughs> yes, right. I would shoot, and high, I shoot a lot of high ISO pictures. Right. I shoot ISO 3200 a lot because I'm shooting indoor sports and stuff like that. And sure propensity for carrying Nikon cameras and glass around. That's right. And so the lens, uh, the uh, noise reduction now works pretty well. Mm -hmm. It allows you to pretty significantly tweak uh, in, in a number of different ways. For one thing, you can do things like um, not just, let's say, one of the things about noise reduction, you talk about the posterization, it removes detail, right? right. You, you decrease the noise. So it allows you to sort of tweak the detail. It has a detail slider. It allows you to kind of take that compromise fit. So you can so have, doesn't everyone love the film grain kind right. of effect? Well, there's <laughs> film grain and there's, you know, the color noise, which right. is really ugly. So, so basically, does it, so real-time preview allows you to kind That's of select right. things on the fly before yep. you can And remember, the other thing about Lightroom is unlike Photoshop, it's non-destructive. Nice. So as you're making your changes, that's saving it off in an XML file, not actually changing the image. That's a big deal, because there's nothing worse than finding out like, like somebody's been messing around with your computer and like your right. favorite picture of Yada. That's right. Turned into your favorite picture of Yada with lots of effects by somebody with maybe that's questionable right. taste. Yep. Not that I'm bitter about an ex-roommate <laughs> um, who shall be stopped. But what, what's going on in terms of, uh, uh, do they add lens correction? Is that new also? Well, they had lens correction before. They've had a lot of manual tweaks to the lens correction, so you can do uh, a lot of tra what's called transforms now. Like I, when I was in Europe, I shot a bunch of pictures of doorways because right. they have like cool doorways in Venice. <laughs> Great like doorways. That. But you know, I would I would used to be shooting them on the fly, so they'd be kind of skewed one way, and I wouldn't be perfectly you know 90 degrees to the door. You can actually go in and start moving that around and make it look like it's perpendicular. Now. So you basically you don't have to be particularly meticulous about your shot. You could you could fix it right. in post. Yes, to a certain <laughs> extent. Now if I'm standing you know 30 degrees from the door <laughs> and I try, you're going to get distortion when you try to do that much correction. But you can do like a few degrees of correction and it looks pretty real. That's pretty amazing actually when you kids you, you don't expect the, you know okay they're going to shift the pixels but it actually right. looks fantastic. It looks really good. Is it shifting the shadows or what's it actually doing? It does a lot. It does a lot of stuff. I mean it's 
not just doing one thing. It's not just moving thing around. It's it's changing all. It's basically messing around with the whole perspective of the image. That's pretty crazy. Now, you yeah. mentioned there were, there were two big changes that made it particularly Lightroom three particularly interesting. One was the fact that the noise reduction That's actually right. works. Was the was the the lens correction the other one? The or? lens correction is one of the other ones. Um, it, it's one of the ones I've been playing with a lot actually, and have most, the most fun with. Anything in time there in terms of like the that it does in terms of managing your library that makes it easier? Can you like batch? You know, edit or yeah, you can. Batch it's comment it's, it's a little stuff. better at doing things like uh, telling, batch copying and batch renaming and stuff like that. The real, the other addition that I like is a lot of the output stuff has been proved. There's a lot new, of new templates for printing, so you can do all kinds of really wacky collages and stuff like that. Or just if you just want to do um, a lot of thumbnails and things like that to look at pictures on, on a printer, what it would look like on a printer, then you can do that too. What's Lightroom running these days? I think the retail is three hundred dollars. You can find it a lot cheaper than that online. Would, would you consider, a, you know, like, I'm, I'm laughing now because it's particularly funny, I'm just like, you know, just when you thought you'd be able to get an amazing camera for under 300 you... Right. <laughs> now, is... the people who have Photoshop, mm -hmm. often should I get Lightroom too? And the short answer is only if you need sort of the special workflow stuff and mm -hmm. library management, because a lot of what's in what's called camera raw in Photoshop is what Lightroom does. Oh, really? Uh, just a more, more sophisticated and friendly user interface. That's an interesting thought. In terms of workflow management, is that something you find yourself using, or is that more like more I'm more. a professional photographer and I shoot like a million pictures a week? I, I'm doing it more and more. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm finding it, previously I would use something called Bridge, which was also an Adobe app, but this is a lot more flexible and sophisticated than Bridge for that kind of stuff. What kind of stuff are you doing with it mostly? Uh, in terms of photo management? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just the sort of managing the library stuff. Okay. So it's the, the fact that it automatically date sorts and stuff like that and, re, and, and names folders for you so you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. That's actually really convenient. Mm -hmm. Flickr, Picasso, would they be considered sort of low-end versions of, of something like this? Well, Picasso, of course, is a standalone app. Flickr is sure. online. Uh, Lightroom actually integrates with Flickr, mm -hmm. so you can actually publish to Flickr and stuff like that automatically. Uh, but Flickr is not really a photo management. I mean, it is right. sort of, but right. Picasso is probably a little better because you have the, it, the integration between the application and, and, and the Picasso website. But now with, with Lightroom, you can do that with Flickr as well. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've been wondering what these photo management tools are all about, I hope Mr. Lloyd answered that question for you. We'll probably have you back on in a few weeks. <laughs> What's the best place to find the latest in Lloyd online? Uh, Maximum PC, uh, PC World, ImprobableInsights.com, and you can always find me on Twitter. Twitter.com slash Lloyd Case. People, follow him if you're not. There's good, good stuff coming from this man. Coming up next, are you thinking about building a new PC? You're going to love our next question. Right now, though, we want to thank one of our sponsors. Squarespace, people. It's a publishing system. It's a hosting system. You want to make yourself an amazing website, you should be checking out squarespace.com. I don't care if it's a blog, a portfolio, something big for your business. It's all built around a pretty amazing tool. It's flexible, it's painless, and you know what? It's pretty awesome because there's no coding experience required to make amazing high-end websites on Squarespace. Yeah, you can get under the hood and adjust code if that's your thing, but you know what? If you can move things around on a screen with your mouse, you can recreate the same functionality as the most expensive highest traffic pages on the web. Worried about moving over your existing website to Squarespace? Check out the importer tool. Chances are you'll find that it makes everything easy to move over to a squarespace.com hosted website. Do us a favor, decide to check out Squarespace. It's gonna be about two weeks to let you play around with it, get under the hood, test everything out. Then they're gonna ask you to bring up the credit card. Use the promotion code TechZilla when you do. You'll get 10% off the lifetime of your order and you'll be helping to support TechZilla and keep us on the internets. Check it out, people, squarespace.com. Please support our sponsor because they support you. Looks like it's time for another Websites We Just Can't Get Enough Of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Slash Film. Do you rely on your friends to tell you what's up in the world of movie news? You don't have to. This movie blog covers all sorts of movie news and reviews as soon as it's available. Be the first to find out who's being cast in Scream 4, watch an exclusive interview with M. Night Shyamalan, did you hear Judd Apatow's producing an upcoming Pee Wee Herman movie? Read reviews of the best movies right out of the Sundance Film Festival, Tribeca Film Festival, and more. Watch trailers for every movie under the sun, domestic and nationwide, as soon as they're released. Find out where to buy that Smurfs Avatar mashup t-shirt. Be notified of the latest deal on your favorite Blu-ray movie. Did you know there's a shirtless Captain Kirk cologne? So if you fancy yourself a film buff, budding auteur, or just love movies, then be the first to hear about everything related to movies at Slash Film. 
We got a question from Germanico who writes in, I want to build a real home theater PC and use it for other things like gaming, ripping, watching DVDs and Blu-rays, and running Adobe's Creative Suite 5. I'm going to be running Windows 7. What software will I need to rip and watch DVDs and Blu-ray movies, and what kind of case CPU and GPU should I pick? I'll be playing games and video at 1080p resolution, and it must be quiet. I was thinking of the AMD 6-core processor or Intel's i720, Germanico, and Quito, Ecuador. Now, if you were doing just a home theater PC and you weren't really looking for the gaming side of things, I love Intel's Atom G uh, CPU combination with NVIDIA's Ion graphics for a low-power home theater PC. I'm thinking you're going to want at least a dual-core system, though. And right. You mentioned that 6-core AMD processor. Uh, I think you're good there. It's the gaming part that could give you some trouble. We'll get to that in a second. Now, Patrick and I both use any DVD HD and Handbrake for archiving DVDs and Blu-ray movies. Uh, a lot of folks swear by the free version of DVD Fab HD Decryptor. Free is a lot less expensive than any DVD HD, and DVD Fab works pretty well getting around most content protection that we've seen. Yeah, I mean, the whole point, Handbrake basically actually rips the information and compresses it into a file format. It's a transcoder. Yeah, what any DVD does is, is get around the copy protection. Illegal in the United States because it's a violation of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, unless you're rich and, and own a Kaleidoscape <laughs> system, but let's not even, let's not, that's let's, licensing. Let's let that one go. Uh, for the rest of the world, though, it, sh it should be fairly legal depending on your local law. I like the AMD 6 core CPU, but I'm currently personally rolling with a Core i7 920 in, in my first high end home theater PC, or uh, home period. It's the only high end PC I've built in years. Some apps in Creative Suite 5 are going to take advantage of all those cores. Pairing it up with at least 4 gigabytes of RAM and an ATI 5770 will do solid gaming, though you can spend a bit more and get more oomph out of your games. The thing is that the resolutions on an HCTV aren't particularly, they're not super high. And, and depending on the video games, you need to do a little bit of research to decide if you're into the super high-end video games, you might want to spend a little bit more on your graphics card. But the, for like 150 bucks, 5770 is a good start. Yeah, I'd say, though, if you plan on gaming at yeah. 1080, resolution though you're gonna need a much powerful graphics card than okay. that either like a 5850 oh. would be about the minimum I would go with and I'm, I'm using a 5870 right now and if you want to turn everything up you're gonna need hardware like that don't don't <laughs> kid yourself that's just you it sounds like you got the CPU part in, in mind uh, four gigs of RAM and so on and also, uh, a lot of the home theater PC specific cases feature those annoyingly bright LCD displays in the front that we've seen. I've, I've had ones that I could actually read by across the room. Really? I, this ruins. I'm the kind home of done with the whole bright light thing, yeah. especially if it's in any way visible and distracting. That's just, it, it, no, I'm not no. there. Uh, we've even some that required uh, proprietary power supplies yeah. to run those displays and uh, or just the lighting systems in general. I, I just go for a solid desktop case, and uh, if you're going to go with an ATX motherboard, or if you want something that blends better with your living room, a mini ITX MOBO is a much in a much smaller case can be done. And yeah. I, I have to say, mini ITX, it, if you can live with the limitations of the size of the motherboard and the features it supports, it's so nice to work on something that small and to be able to put that in. And your power requirements drop, yet you can still maintain, you know, right. high-end CPUs, usually one slot for the graphics card. You know, there you go. Uh, you can always check out Antex Performance One lineup of cases for ATX MOBOs and the super uh, quiet. Those really, are super quiet. That's my other big requirement nowadays. Yeah. I don't want to hear the darn thing. <laughs> also, uh, they have an ISK series if you want to go with the mini ITX MOBO. That's also worth checking out. Yeah, so Antex. I, I really, I, I own a lot of Antex cases. Uh, one of them fell apart because somebody used it as a footstool. Aww. Yeah, I went with Silverstone last time around, and really? you like except it? for I, I like it a lot. The overall design and the look of it, uh, it's all aluminum, beautiful, but uh, it's a little little pricey. And one of the fans, it's got this giant fan on the top, and the uh, it's kind of a pain to remove the filter for it, <laughs> which is important in these summertime days where it gets so warm out. You got to keep the airflow the going. Cats nicely, been but, sleeping on the computer. But yeah. uh, thank goodness not. But <laughs> and I keep it off the floor too, so it's a little. That's, you got to keep these things clean. They're dust collectors otherwise, but absolutely. Oh, you know, the one thing we didn't mention is a wireless keyboard and mouse. You're going to want a full-size wireless keyboard and mouse. Check the older episodes of the show. We talked about that a lot. Dramatico, hope that one helps you out a bit. Coming up next, people, more fewer questions. But first, let's thank one of our sponsors, Gamefly. Gamefly.com, people. They are the largest online video game rental service. We're talking about over 7,000 titles, new, classic, all consoles and handheld. Do you want to get your game on for 16 bucks a month? Actually, $15.95 a month. If you're a Gamefly member, you can score one to four games at a time, keep them for as long as you like. Doesn't matter how long it takes to finish that game, because there's no late fees, no due dates, and the shipping 
from your house to their place, from their place to your house, because you don't even have to leave your house to get on Gamefly. It's very nice. Look, you're done playing a game, send it back. Gamefly sends you the next available game in the list. It's really simple. You want to buy the game, click keep it on the Gamefly website. You're going to get the game at a discounted price. Gamefly will even mail you the case and manuals free of charge. Want to try it for free? Techzilla fans get a two-week free trial. Just go to Gamefly.com slash Techzilla. Server restrictions do apply. Please see the site for details. And please support Techzilla's sponsors like Gamefly.com. Viewer named Bob in St. Charles, Missouri writes in, whatever happened to piezoelectric chip cooling fans for PCs? Were they too expensive or not efficient? I heard a ton of hype about them in 2006 and not much thereafter. Just wondering, sign Bob in St. Charles. M-O. I was reading this, right? And at first I thought you meant Peltier coolers. They're thermoelectric devices made from two, basically two different metals that create a temperature difference when you apply a voltage to it, right? Oh, yeah. They remember they got sand, like you put a regular cooler or a water cooler on top, piezo cooler, and then the processor. And Peltier coolers are also called cold plates, are essentially solid state refrigerators or heat pumps. And they're pretty scarce these days. Frozen CPU sells them raw and built into water blocks. They're interesting for overclockers because they can reduce temperature below the ambient temperature of the air or water moving over it. They're great for setting records, but they are prone to creating condensation problems if not properly installed. And that's all I remember. You ended up yeah. with a very hot component and something that's basically developing <laughs> frost. Yeah, <laughs> all at the same time. And, and then I realized you were talking about piezoelectric fans, right? Piezoelectric materials either move uh, when electricity is applied to them or they generate electricity when they're bent or twisted or as Wikipedia says, in response to applied mechanical strain, which is twisting. If you've used like a scanning, I want to say electron microscope or, or maybe a scanning problem microscope or a push, mostly a push button starter, light a grill, you've got your piezoelectric technology on. There was a pretty big push on some tech blogs, probably around a press release. I, I want to say Piezo Systems was the name of the, the, the manufacturer. They still make and sell piezoelectric fans. They're pretty slick actually. They're single blade devices that flap, or to read the description on piezo.com, piezoelectric fans have a flat geometry and shed vortices of air from the leading edge of their vibrating blade, which means they flap. It's an interesting concept, and it's pretty much silent, but we're talking about a half a cubic foot to two cubic feet of air per minute. Your typical PC cooler is moving 40 to 60 cubic feet per minute if it uses fans at all, because basically they figured out they could create these gigantic monstrosities and actually create enough surface area where you didn't necessarily need a fan or an external fan or something other than the can to move air across it. Interesting idea that piezoelectric coolers, or fans I should say, but not really useful in terms of moving heat inside most PCs. So they're still out. You can buy one from piezo.com. I don't know what it's going to cost you. I'm all about air coolers. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. sealed systems in general. Even just, better. Mm -hmm. Or less, a closet with an air conditioner and a filtered air... So, oh, you know. <laughs> I ain't gonna start. Who wants some cable modem help? Gavin does. Gavin writes in, I have a really old cable modem and I want to upgrade to something that includes wireless. I do a lot of downloading and gaming as well as streaming videos through my Xbox. I was wondering what routers you would suggest at the high end. I looked into a Motorola Surfboard SBG6580 since it would be a dual modem and router, but I can't find any reviews of it. Thanks, Gavin. I didn't even think actually Motorola sold like I, I the like I didn't think you could buy the surfboard wireless modems in, in terms of the public right I saw a bunch up on oh, eBay yeah. for like two hundred fifty bucks two hundred twenty bucks well I was interested in getting a Doxus three modem for right. my cable service so I could get the you know if I when I eventually want to move up to fifty megabit per second <laughs> speeds and pay through the nose for it I'd have a modem that I owned because I'm also renting the modem from the cable provider for oh, about no, no. three bucks a month. I bought a cable but modem it's, it's, immediately. But it's three bucks a month, and you gotta leverage that against the cost of the product you're about to buy. Like, if I'm gonna spend a hundred bucks, how many months of service would that be before I actually get my money back out of it? I bought my first cable modem for 50 bucks. I've had it for five years, which means I've saved three times 12 times five. Which Good money. Which is a lot more than... Good money. Yeah, I've saved money. See, I've also needed to upgrade a modem too, so it was really nice. I had a problem with the modem, so right. it was, oh, I, I'm renting, so I just take it back and get exchange it for another one. Anyway, this particular product you're looking at is a Doxus 3 modem with a four port gigabit switch built into it, this router, as well as uh, 802.11 and Wi-Fi. So it is really everything in one. 
I'm a little leery about those all-in-one products, but it is compatible with most cable companies. Uh, at least I know with Comcast, they're yeah. big on the whole surfboard thing. So I mean, the nice thing about cable modems is they're all all cable modems are essentially certified by the same organization, Cable Labs, which is run basically by cable companies. Personally, though, I keep your Wi-Fi router and your cable modem separate because unless your cable company has updated things on their end, you're probably not going to actually gain anything upgrading the cable modem on your end. Yep, I have a gigabit N router with right. wireless N uh, four port gigabit switching uh, for about half the price of what that product's going to cost you from Motorola. And then, I, okay, say 75 bucks left, and then you could either rent that modem for, like I said, three to five bucks right. a month. It's usually closer to three. Way the costs out there, but I, yeah. I still prefer having separate devices, like you said. Yeah, I mentioned last week, Netgear's a $150 WNDR3700. That's pretty much the wireless end router to beat at the top of the line for 80 bucks or so. Uh, Buffalo's WZRHP G300NH is still getting marks for solid performance, especially if you have basically issues in corners of your house or the, the far edges of the living room and stuff like that. External antennas on that bad boy. Uh, it's worth checking out. Both will support 802.11g if you don't have any end clients yet. If you don't have any end devices yet, like your computer or your notebook or your, you know, iPad or whatever it is, um, you may want to go with like a fifty, a cheap fifty dollar uh, 802.11g modem or 802.11g modem. Like the BG modems yeah. are out there and they're popular and they're they're affordable. You as buy well. them on Craigslist for like eight dollars now. So I'm just saying, you know, because end, end routers are, should continue to get better and get cheaper over time. Have you heard the news, people? Revision 3 has an official, official iPhone app. Now you can go watch Revision 3 on the go with the new official Revision 3 iPhone app. Watch all your favorite Revision 3 shows like Dig Nation, Texilla, AC Nation, App Judgment, and more for free on your iPhone. You can find that in the iTunes store for download or go to revision3.com slash iPhone for more information. And in other news, I am sad to say the internet sitcom Web Zeroes here at Revision 3 is coming to an end. This week, the tale of pursuit of internet stardom comes to a close, and we say goodbye to our pals Nate, Alex, and Ray. Don't miss the last episode, people. The series finale coming out this week at revision3.com slash webzeros. And don't worry, if you missed an episode, you can go back and catch up on season one and season two, all at revision3.com slash webzeros. Hey, for everybody watching out there, we live on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how-tos, you ask us. We'll do it, but we need your email, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have at the end, the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on the show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Mm -hmm. Share your thoughts, ideas, and comments with other fans of the show. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Herron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Did you know there's a shirtless Captain Kirk cologne? <laughs> awesome. I like that. I got some weird bump on my lip. I got bit by something. <laughs> Jim Mange. Falling apart, man. <laughs> Everything itches. It tastes like burning. Hey, a viewer named Bob writes in. He says, oh, from St. Charles, Missouri writes in. Uh, let me Missouri. Just start that Missouri. 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 Not saying Missouri.